Okay, so this is an early just video. I'm probably going to, I 99% sure I'm going to come back. I just stumbled upon um, Infinite Self. And I don't know how many of you through your own volition have gone and sought out Stuart Wilde since I've been talking about him. But just in case, like, I feel like if anybody even hears a little bit of him, he's so compelling and interesting. Um, Infinite Self is like his, um, well, you'll hear. So Wayne Dyer introduces him. Hi, beautiful Lila. Wayne Dyer calls him his spiritual soulmate. So cute, right? So this is 33 steps to reclaiming your inner power. I used to carry this book around like a Bible, like in my purses, um, but really his voice. Hello, Tell me if it's too loud. Welcome to our program on the 33 steps to reclaiming your infinite power. Before we go into the actual text and talk about the whole philosophy of the 33 steps, let me give you a little bit of background about myself. Up until the age of 11, I was raised in Africa. It was a very, very liberal existence. Basically, I played on the beach. In fact, I cannot remember any school that I went to before I was 11. I'm sure I must have gone to some schools, but I've forgotten them. That's how much impact they had upon me. I cannot remember the name of a school, any of the children that were there, the Just classes, started. the teachers. School was not my trip until I was 11 years old anyway. So I was hanging out on the beaches of Africa. The sound okay? And then I was sent to an old English boarding school, one of those real old, old mausoleums that have been there since the beginning of time. It was really strict, and it was loveless and grim and had loads of rules and an enormous amount of restriction. I stayed at the school from the age of 11 to 17, and by the time I got out, I was keen, real peachy keen on discovering freedom. I thought to myself, hey, I've had freedom in Africa. Then I had restriction. I've done restriction. I've graduated from restriction. Now give me freedom again. So part of my journey in life has been discovering freedom. In my 20s, I decided that freedom came from money. I didn't know any better then. So I hurtled out and tried to make a back of money as quickly as possible. In those days, in England, it was the back end of the swinging 60s, and things were really hopping and bopping. So if you were a lively lad, money came your way, and I made oodles of it. I was in the jeans business making 20,000 bucks a week. 20,000 bucks a week in jeans. That was still worth close to a buck. At that time, I was about 21 years old. But having loads of money so young was almost fatal. I went down the ego's path of self-destruction. Drugs, sex, rock and roll, and all sorts of nihilistic activity that was guaranteed to kill you before you got to 30. Having done that and got the t-shirt 10 times over, I got to the ripe old age of 28 and decided, hey, wait a minute, there's got to be more to life than this. And that's what got me into my spiritual quest. I think for all of us, we have to have at some point the desire. Sometimes the great wonderful goodness that is the invisible universe around us delivers to us a change, a special turning point. In the film business, they call it a plot point, when suddenly 20 minutes into the film, something different happens. Well, some people have a plot point whereby they get terribly sick. For others, they have a plot point whereby they whack a tree, like at 70 miles an hour, say. That usually turns them around. Or there's a divorce, I think that's a death in the family, a bankruptcy, or something weird happens. Generally speaking, when the ego is ticking along and is very pleased with itself, it doesn't want to consider, and it won't allow you to consider, spirituality, different belief patterns, ancient wisdoms, consolidation of power, and personal disciplines, or the kind of stuff that is involved in the sacred quest. Usually what happens is you have to burn out all of the ego's options first, and then whack a tree. So when you read in the newspaper that four people whacked a tree last night, know that they're basically seeking their infinite self. Of course, listening to this study course and following the simple instructions is a lot safer. But some people are in a hurry to discover themselves, so they whack a tree instead. It's basically their desire to reach God. That's what they're doing. So you don't have to get too emotionally upset. It's just the process of arriving at God. They just did it rather quickly. Well, I did my arriving at God by 28 because by then I was really bored, really fed up and totally psychotic. I mean, I was totally dysfunctional. One day I did a very clever thing. I got rid of everything. I got rid of the Rolls Royce, the staff, all the hangers on. 
and I gave what was left of my business to my partner. I had an apartment in London on Chelsea Embankment, which is a pretty kind of large da area. I remember thinking one day, I want to leave. I want to be free. No more BS. I want things that are true and real and good. In the hallway of my apartment was a very expensive set of mirrors. So I rang up a friend of mine and said, send a guy with a van. I'm going to give you a gift of some mirrors. So he came along and unhooked all the mirrors and hauled them off. Then on the day when I left the apartment, and you've got to think in terms of this apartment being worth about $400,000 in today's money. The morning I left the apartment, I closed the door. I didn't cut off the telephone. I didn't cut off the electricity. I didn't write to the bank and explain to them why they weren't getting their mortgage. I didn't know them very much. And I had loads and loads of equity in the apartment, but I didn't care about the money. I didn't even eat the food in the refrigerator, nothing. I left all my clothes and all of the furniture, bar the mirrors, of course, and I left the apartment like I was going around the corner to the 7-Eleven. I walked down the street and I made a right along Chelsea Embankment, and not far from the building was a little drain, and I unclipped the front door key of the apartment and dropped it down the drain. That's how much I wanted to change. I was leaving. And as I walked out of there and left, that was the beginning of my spiritual quest. I decided, hey, Stewie, it's time for something different. Stewie. So anyway, luckily enough, I found a spiritual teacher who started teaching me about Taoism. What's so beautiful about Taoism is that it teaches you to detach, not only to detach from the world emotion, the emotion of your family, the emotions of the people around you, but you learn to detach from your own emotions so that you're not so much a victim of what's going on inside of you. The beauty of this philosophy is it teaches you to observe your own reactions. It's almost like standing above yourself and watching what's going on rather than owning the whole opera. You can observe your urges. You can observe your disquiet. You're not so much a victim of your own stuff. Some of the material in this introductory session I originally touched upon in a book I wrote some years ago called The Force. In that book, I explain the whole idea of the infinite reality in all things, and I introduce the reader to the idea of the Taoist philosophy. The Tao is an interesting thing. It's a Chinese philosophy that comes from about 500 BC. It is actually written Taoist, Tears and Tommy, A-O-I-S-T. So it's written Taoist and pronounced with a D, Taoist. That always confused the hell out of me in the early days anyway. It came about because the people that studied the Chinese language in the early days tried to translate the Chinese sound into an English letter. And they never really did make up their mind whether it was Dao or Tao. So in the end, it's pronounced Dao and actually written Tao with a T. So you've probably seen the um, Tao Te Ching or Tao Te Ching in your local bookshop. The wonderful thing about it is that people buy the book and read it. It's all very flowery and they haven't got a clue what it means. And I must say, when I first started, I didn't either. But the beauty of the philosophy is that unlike a lot of religions, it doesn't have any rules. So it was naturally attractive to me. It has very simple concepts that are very inspiring and definitely take you from the world of ego, glamour, and illusion into the spirituality of the infinite self. So I was very influenced by Taoism. The world of the ego is one of agony, pure agony for most people, because even when the ego is being kept happy, it's never really happy. You can give it a new car, you can give it a new snowmobile, some sexual experiences, you can get it drunk, you can stuff it full of food, and it wakes up the following morning and it nails a list of things to your forehead. It says, hey, sucker, get me this and get me that. I feel insecure. I want more of this and more of that. So the ego always leans towards dysfunction. You cannot possibly come to any kind of serenity. This is what I was saying, I think, from one of my notes, that it's always going to be easier to master the ego than to satisfy it because it's insatiable, right? And that's so funny because you can fill it with food, fill it with this, fill it with that. It'll wake up the next day and have a, uh, a list of things that it wants the next day. In what the Eastern mystics call Maya, the illusion, in the ego-driven world. 
Of course, when you think about it, this physical plane is a glorious experience. From a spiritual perspective, we don't really have any negative energy on this plane. We only have the illusion of negative energy. Let me explain. All negative energy comes from the ego. In other words, what we call the negative experience is any contradiction of the ego's opinion. So anytime that something happens in life that contradicts you, you'll consider you've suffered a negative experience. So you want to live a pain-free existence and you fall off the sidewalk and break your ankle and there's a contradiction. You want a simple lifestyle with plenty of money and the check bounces, you get laid off from your job and there's another contradiction. You want a reasonable flow, reasonable happiness, reasonable gratification, and your spouse gives you a hard time, your kids drive you crazy, Tammy. the boss is harassing you, and here are a few more contradictions. You want to be cozy and warm, and it's belting down with rain. So what we as humans call negative experiences are really only contradiction of the ego's opinion. Emotional pain is all self-inflicted. It doesn't make it pleasant, but once you can see that it comes from the ego's decisions, you can begin to heal it and heal it quickly. So in my method, there are no real absolutes. In other words, it's an illusion to say we've got to be cozy. We've got to be safe. We've got to be rich. We've got to be healthy. We've got to live forever. That's another one of the ego's special legislations, isn't it? You may I live would never forever, want to live forever. And you may not. The point about living forever is... There is no point in living forever if you live in a TikTok prison. There's no point in living forever if your life is a complete dysfunctional mess. It's better that you live a week or two as a realized, free, totally serene, loving human being than living 80 years a week in the or two. of the ego. How long you live is irrelevant. It's the quality of life while you're alive that matters. If today was your last day on Earth, the only tragedy would be if you hadn't experienced life properly, if you'd never allowed yourself to actually live it. What's the point of life if the whole of it has been one of pain, anguish, dysfunction and worry? That's useless. Which would be our choice. But if you've managed to reconcile yourself, if hey, you look within, if you've reclaimed this infinite power within you, then all of a sudden you can say, yeah, Yes, you. I've done it. I got there. I got the T-shirt, bro. I'm happy to go into another dimension. I'm complete. So when we look at people's lives, it isn't really the length of their lives. It's the quality. Yet looking around our nation, we can see that the quality of people's lives is going down the gurgler. They're getting worse and worse, sicker and sicker. So you've got two options. You can sit around and get ill or you can do something about it. So the very first part of this journey, in my view, is desire. What is your desire? What is your desire to consolidate your power? What is your desire to become free? What is your desire to perceive the world in a different way? Can you let go of where you find yourself today? You don't have to go crazy like I do, because I'm a bit of a lunatic. I go over the top on everything. And you don't necessarily have to walk out of your house and leave. But in the end, it's the level of your desire because spirit never comes down to fetch you. Spirit doesn't wander around saying, anybody here want to get realized? Anybody here want to transcend? It's not whistling in the marketplace trying to drum up business. It sits Funny. there passively and waits for you to come and get it. So you have to reach up. Imagine yourself listening to this session and you're actually putting your arm up and reaching up and saying to that infinite God force inside of you, whatever which way you may want to describe it, Buddha, the Christ consciousness, Krishna, the Tao, whatever, reaching up and saying, hey, I want to change. I want to go beyond where I find myself. Because if I don't, I'll bore myself stupid. You've got to want to, and that's the first move. I wanted to, I must say. I had a lot of desire and a lot of tenacity, a lot. I've heard that in some surveys of people that buy these audio programs, it says that they never actually listen to the program. They leave them on the bookshelf so they can look as though they're learning 
And of the people that do listen to these programs, many don't follow through to the end. Maybe these people don't really have a desire to change. So, bro, sister, if you're listening to this program and you have got the desire to change, you better get to the end of it. Otherwise, I'm going to zing around to your place and box your little spiritual ears. Because in the end, the laziness of the ego, the self-indulgence of the ego, the importance of the ego will kill you. So at some point, you actually wind up being in a war with yourself. If you let the ego win, then you're bound to fail. So if you say, I'm going to impose a discipline upon myself. I'm going to listen to these sessions for 30 minutes every day, commuting, say. This is an important thing that I've talked about before, and it comes from Stuart Wilde. Even the smallest things, like it's very important. Um, this is one of the most important things that I gleaned, and I feel really lucky to have like completely, uh, I own it. I won't say like, I'm going to go jogging tomorrow. If I'm, if I think like even 99 or 1%, I want, I'm not going to go jogging. Your subconscious brain starts to not trust what you say. Um, people, I mean, the topic of people just talking without thinking or, you know, hearing themselves talk, whatever, that's um, beyond what I'm saying. Very specifically, if um, you don't think like, uh, I got to quit smoking, I got to quit smoking, that kind of stuff, it hurts my heart. I'm like, just smoke until you're ready to quit smoking. But to tell yourself you're going to do something the next day or tonight or whatever, and even an iota, even like if, if I'm planning on jogging tomorrow and there could be a chance I'm going to have coffee, so I'm not going to do it or whatever, something could happen. I won't tell myself that. And this is how I go to sleep and I tell myself to wake up at six and I don't set alarms. I mean, I do it to make sure like when I have students and stuff like that, but your brain innately is designed to believe and trust your internal dialogue more than anyone else. Unfortunately, we've gotten to a place that we're reeling it back, right? Where 80 to 90, something like 80 to 90% of internal dialogue has been shown to be negative, uh, self-deprecatory, redundant, um, did I say some redundant? You know what I mean? So we're just talking shit to ourselves most of the time. And then we're like, ah, you know, it's, it's, and it, it causes a lot of, I mean, not me, but um, we can all think about it more, you know, absolutely. I can think about that more, but I just wanted to stop there because he's saying it about having a commitment to finish. Like this book is no bullshit. Um, I think this program is no bullshit. I didn't do the cold showers. I still, they're just, hard for me. But um, even the littlest things, like if I can just add a takeaway just from this video, obviously he's gold, but um, being really disciplined with yourself about what you tell yourself you're going to do. And it's not a, a bad thing or whatever. Just stop telling yourself, stop putting unrealistic things on yourself, if that makes sense. And maybe replace it with realistic ones. Like I'll have a carrot or whatever. If a carrot is something that is in alignment with good to a friend for, for 30 you. minutes in the car. You know what I mean? Because that's your discipline gone. Then your mind thinks, see, she's weak. She didn't follow through with her commitment. So sit your friend in the front seat and say, hey, listen, shut up for a while. I'm reclaiming my infinite self. I'm listening to session six. And you follow through. Hold on one second, because I don't know how long Mickey's going to be here. Are you still here? I've never met anybody or known anybody that met Stuart. Actually, I know one person that went, I met one person that went to a, like a discourse many years ago. You went on a, like one of his retreats. Are you still here, Mickey? That is so fascinating to me. And what's an art band? Cool. Do you mind answering some questions? He's like one person that I was like, I think he died. You, you can know, but you'll know more than me. 2014 or 18, something like this. When I found out about him, I was like, I got to find this guy. And like, it was like within two or three weeks, they were like, yeah, he died like four years ago. I was like, Arr! but I know that that doesn't mean like what we think it is. Like, I can't get him out of my mind right now. I think it's, I mean, not like that, 
<laughs> it's so important to talk about him. What's an art band? And what were and um your art band? What's an art band? I, I wanted to, and I asked you, what did he feel like? Like what was like the energy of him? Is he just like this in person, just the same? That must have been such a cool experience. Did you take cold showers? Did you walk in the forest in the night and without shoes in the cold? He's such a fucking badass. I had a student that did that. He did the cold shower thing. He trained us as Genghis Khan taught his soldiers. How long was the retreat? Was it all men? I heard, like, when I hear him talk about it, I think it's, like, mostly men, just, like, it's not co-ed, right? He was, like, never sleazy like that. Isn't that dope? Jared a G. Jared knows what's up. His retreats, like, okay, first of all, part of Infinite Self, I don't know if it's actually part of the program. Mickey would know. Um, 51, 5-1. That is set for like some Masonic thing. He died. He, he was not. He used to say, I remember uh, he said, you guys think that you guys think this is the fucking heaven. You guys think you're going to hell after this. This is the fucking hell. He has such a like a potty mouth, but he's like so full of love. Um, I think the day he died is like a Masonic holiday. Somebody recently told me that. I don't know. But he died like smoking a cigarette going 70 as I understand it, down a highway, but like an empty highway. Where's Mickey at? He trained us as Genghis Khan. <laughs> Did he allow women? He was so powerful. I loved his cussing. Was he smoking cigarettes too? So the way I understand, and Mickey's going to give us as much info, Ashley, OG, store to OG. Okay, so... Um, all about like, you, you. we were listening about breaking down the ego ultimately to, you know, to lead to self-mastery and freedom. Um, so ways that he started to, like before he started having retreats that Mickey, I'd be interested to know how you even found out about him or like what year that was. Before he started like speaking to people, thousands of people, taking people on retreats, like he did this stuff himself, waking up at four in the morning, all seasons, going barefoot, walking barefoot in the forest at like dark, like 3 a.m., cold showers every single day, um, like hardcore. And towards the end, Mickey, do you know about like his talks towards the end when he starts like, like all those, he was like, he was at the end, he was literally living like in the veil. Like he was talking about so many like spiritual things that were happening. And he was just like, calling bullshit on them like just dimensional stuff was revealed to him like does that make sense what i'm saying mid 80s your client would talk about him while i did hair so interesting do you mind if i ask how many how long the retreat was was it so hardcore did you take cold showers did you walk in the cold Forest with no shoes. See, my my stuff is so stupid. I'd be like, I'd be afraid to step on a worm or like some dumb shit like that. <laughs> Can I wear sandals? It absolutely makes sense. Um, what's up, Chris Mack? Oh, you're so cute. Yeah, guys, like the video, please. Listen to Chris Mack or else. Smack that ass. Um, Mickey, I'm going to stop again. If you feel like sharing more, if you're just getting here, um, he finished kind of talking about, um, he's going to say something funny now. If you're not committed to this, throw it in the trash can or better yet, give it to someone you don't like. <laughs> I mean, wait, by the way, Mickey, was he, end, if you're was he cracking you up the whole fucking time? No walking without shoes, cold showers. First night, he released the pull button snakes. Wait, what? What are you talking about? What are you talking about? Snakes? 
see, okay, his retreats were not bullshit. They're not like, you know, sipping cocktails on the beach. He's like, I mean, he, um, what do you call it? What's the word? He achieved self mastery. He destroyed his ego and like lived in his heart. It makes my eyes water. He's such a sweet soul. I mean, like with all of his cussing and all of his, his like intense stuff, he's all about love. Like that's all he's about and freedom. He never paid taxes, by the way. Did you know that, Mickey? Wait, what are you talking about? Release the pull button, pull python snakes. We're uh, listening to Infinite Self, Stuart Wild, and he's a boss. He's an OG. Enough said. So Mickey actually went on a retreat with him. He passed in 2015, I think. Someone found. Hi, Erica. Yes. But the retreats were basically breaking ego down, breaking ego retreat. So I'm interested to know what he did with snakes. I never heard about that, but I imagine it was fucking, uh, took a little notch off your ego. Then your mind knows it isn't. You say you're going to do something and you don't. What happens is the mind gets stronger. The ego gets stronger. It dominates your life even more. It harasses you more. So if you're coming along this journey with me, make the commitment. And if you don't want to make the commitment, then throw the program out the window. Or better still, give it to someone you don't like. But if you're making the commitment, if you want to be in the show, so to speak, you've got to commit to taking the time to listen, taking the time to get to the end. Because as we go through these 33 steps, it's going to set you free. It will liberate you from lots of unnecessary weight. So some of the concepts set you free immediately and you'll get it. And some of them set you free later on, three months from now, nine months from now, five years from now. When you comprehend what they mean, what they really mean, you'll see things in a deeper way. It's almost like an onion. You can take off one little peel and you see the next skin below it. You take that skin off and you see the next one and so on. You're always going deeper and deeper within yourself. So stuff that you heard 10 years ago, sometimes you hear it again, and suddenly you see it at a whole different level, in a different light. So that's what this thing's all about. It's about desire to evolve, desire to become something different. Certainly, I had desire, as I mentioned before, being brought up in Africa and going through a very rigid English education and then into a very rigid English society. I really, really cranked up inside of me the perception that I didn't fit. And of course, there are millions and millions of people around the world that don't fit. In my books, I call them fringe dwellers. The fringe dwellers are not hobos or hippie travelers necessarily, and they're not anarchists that are trying to blow up City Hall. They're just people that know there's something else other than the ego and TikTok and control and the institutions. They're people that know and believe in a different reality, an alternative idea. The fringe dwellers are not necessarily attacking anything. They just don't fit because they've sort of worked their way out of restriction, so to speak. They've worked their way through the popular emotion and the popular beliefs, and they've worked through TikTok and all of that stuff. They live in a different world. And yet, they may still be driving a bus for the city bus company, but in their hearts, they've moved to the outer edge of this human evolution, to the outer edge of the popular emotion that most people consider normal reality. I'm certainly a fringe dweller, and probably you are as well. Otherwise, you wouldn't have been attracted to these teachings. If you don't know you're a fringe dweller, sit down and have a little think about it. I'm sure you bloody well are. You know, like, you're weird, man. You're totally weird, and I'm totally weird. And there's millions of us, weirdos all over the planet, that are actually different in our consciousness. What happened to me is probably what happened to you. As I tried to fit, as I tried to mold myself into the three-piece suit, to mold myself into the English class system, the whole social structure, and 
trot off to Royal Ascot and get a top hat and all that and go to the races and there's the Queen moseying up the track in her little carriage and everybody's so lardy da I couldn't do it. I couldn't fit. I would laugh and think to myself, what the heck am I doing here? The bottom line comes down to, hey, if you're a fringe dweller, if your mindset doesn't fit, then just agree to not fit. Why struggle? Sure, you've got to do things at work. Sure, you've got to shop at Christmas time and do all that away in the manger stuff. But in the end, in your heart of hearts, what you've really got to do is design a bridge that is going to take you from this side, where it's all TikTok and restriction and not fitting, across a river of consciousness to the other side. And that's where the infinite self dwells. Once you start to look at the world as energy, once you start to look at yourself as energy, once you have the desire to perceive, you will automatically write a different evolution for yourself. Think of it like this. Most people that are into consciousness, that are into working on themselves, accept the idea that life is created by them. If you're imbalanced, things go wrong. If you put out a lot of negative energy, you get a lot of negative results. These are not particularly awesome, shattering concepts for people. Most people are beginning to accept, or they already accept, that they create their reality. However, think of this. If you're inside the popular emotion, if you believe what everybody else believes, if you tick-tock along the way they tick-tock along, you're bound to wind up inside the group evolution of your people. You're bound to wind up where they are going. Because if you're not thinking differently, if you're not acting differently, if you don't have a different perception of life, you've got to be putting out what everybody else is putting out. And you'll wind up where everybody else is going. I've asked people in my seminars and lectures, how many of you are prepared to do nothing and just sit and be dragged along in the collective popular evolution? Because if you're happy to do that, you're going to wind up where everybody else is going to wind up. Of all the places I've played, and I've played hundreds of cities, I can think of only one person that ever put up their hand in response to that question. And I said to him, fine, if you want to sit there and go along with the popular emotion, the popular evolution, good luck to you. But most everybody wants to go to something different. But if you think the way that you've always thought, if you do the things that you've always done, if you act in the same way, if you have the same emotions and beliefs, you're bound to wind up where everyone else is going. If you don't fancy that, you've got to change. You've got to select a whole different belief pattern, a different emotion, a whole different way of operating. Discipline, silence, respect for the spirituality within you. You can't have it both ways. You can't just sit and do couch potato and go, yes, oh, that's a lovely idea. Oh, yes, smashing. Oh, yes, very positive. Very nice. Oh, lovely. And do nothing. You've got to be action-oriented and you've got to want to. You've got to have the desire to change. And that, of course, is the key. Wishing to evolve, wishing to change. You've got to remember also that you're not on your own. I believe that the whole of the planet is basically one consciousness. That we're all little microscopic bits inside that consciousness. The whole of the human mind, in my view, is like one great hologram. Each of us, one dot in the hologram. You and me. If I change, it helps you. If you change, it helps me. Bit by bit. This whole consciousness thing. If I change, it helps you. You change, it helps me. It's kind of crossed religion. It's kind of crossed institutions. It is the journey back to God. You can call God anything you want, because I'm sure he, she, or it doesn't give a damn what you call it. But the fact is, consciousness flows out and changes people. So we all wake up. It helps us. We are moving the evolution of this planet forward. So if you incorporate a couple of three new concepts in your mind and you raise your energy a little bit, you consolidate yourself, then that helps other people, especially the people that you come into contact with, that are going to feel your energy, that are going to see the difference.
But I also believe in the general sense, as your consciousness raises, the collective consciousness of all of our people becomes more aware. So we're all pushing energy in the same direction. We're trying to create a more loving, more conscious, better put together society for all our people. Hey, it may take a little while, it may take everybody 500 years to go beyond being so assaholic. But hey, what difference does Asaholic. it make? Assaholic. If you're infinite, it can take as long as you like. In fact, it's cool to think to yourself, at least we're moving forward. At least something's happening. At least we're making some kind of effort. That's the whole point of these 33 steps. To generate a new energy. To generate effort. To accept the discipline. Self-discipline so that you perceive and look and also understand that you cannot create a brand new energy, go to a brand new place and still hold on to where you find yourself now. In other words, if you want to flow down this eternal river of perception towards your infinite self, you've got to let go of the branch that you're hanging on to and just let the river take you. That means you have to face your insecurities. You have to face your fears and really look at yourself. Sometimes to look at yourself is extremely painful because what you see is like piles and piles of caca, loads of it. And you think, my God, I'm grim. I'm totally assaholic. I need to join totally Assaholics Anonymous. Assaholics Anonymous. I'm so assaholic, it's absolutely painful. Then as you get into that and <laughs> see how assaholic you are, you can love yourself. You can look in the mirror and say, man, this is one of the world's greatest asses, but I love him. I love her and I'm going to change her. And that's what's so great about this process. Think of this. If you were perfect, if you were totally angelic, if you were marvelous, I mean, totally over the top, perfect, saintly, whatever, you wouldn't be here. The whole point of our evolution on this earth plane is to come down here with all the crud and all the muck and all the violence and all the sickness and the fact that everyone is so dysfunctional and ill and we have to accept it accept the restriction just getting into this physical body is a very restricting experience you wake up in the morning and there it is 180 pounds much too fat and you have to schlep it around all day and haul it about just being in the physical, that's grim. You've got to haul it around. So we accept the restriction. We accept the negativity. We accept the ego. We accept evil. We accept all of these things in order to transcend them. Because if this place were perfect, we wouldn't show up. We wouldn't incarnate into this body. We'd look at it and we'd think, nah, it's much too yawnsome. It's too boring. I'm not going down to the physical. It's just like watching paint dry down there. There's nothing going on. So you are what you are, and you have what you have, and it's all up in the air. It can go either way, but you've got to want to drive it towards that infinite self. You've got to want to come. You've got to want to let go and make the journey. At this point, I want you to come to the next session, okay? No ifs, buts, or maybes. Just get on with it. Good on you. See you at the next session, and don't take long. Because I like my spirituality in the hurry up. I can't mess around waiting for you, and you can't mess around waiting for yourself. We're going to get this concept, and we're going to get it quick. That's what I like about Taoism. It's short. It's the only philosophy in the world that's only 81 paragraphs long. When I saw that, I thought to myself, bro, this is perfect. I like a philosophy that's only 81 paragraphs long. Tiny little paragraphs at that. Almost like a poem, really. Perfect. Nice and short. Next session. Let's go, bro. Sister. Let's go. Ciao. Date you. Store it wild, infinite self.
Um, so I don't know when he's going to start speaking again, but I guess the takeaways from that first part would be don't tell yourself you're going to do things unless you know 100% you're going to do them. A lot of people say, I'm going to go on a diet tomorrow. I'm going to quit smoking tomorrow. And they know they're not going to, right? This kind of stuff over time strengthens the ego, weakens discipline, internal discipline, heart, freedom. Um, it all should make sense. Thanks, Jared. Thanks, Jared. You guys want to know the funniest thing since apparently weed is normal these days? I got a pack of joints and they're all lemons. Like, no joke. Let's see how this starts. <laughs> like, I'm not joking you. This is, well, I just literally broke one. Did I? I don't really care if I did. Oh, it's okay. Maybe it'll make it work. Congratulations on making it to the second session. Before we get into the actual 33 steps, let me talk to you a bit about the overall concept of the infinite being within. As I said before, I was very influenced by the Tao Te Ching. And what I liked about the Tao was its purity, its simplicity, and the fact that it's not a religion. It doesn't have rules, regulations. Yoga's not a religion either. The Tao Te Ching was written about 500 BC, in theory, by a person called Lao Tzu. Lao Tzu means old man. So nobody actually knows who the author of the Tao Te Ching was. It has been Hold on, that the Tao Te Ching is a mixture of several different writers. I want to frustrate myself with this joint. you can see different styles and different ideas in the text. However, as I said, it's very, very short. I'd like to read you the first few lines of the Tao and then explain them to you. I'm going to use Arthur Whaley's translation because it is really Do it, the Stuart. definitive translation. Do it, we're ready, right? Ching, Bring one. it. The way that we have been told of is not the unvarying way. The names that can be named are not unvarying names. It was from the nameless that heaven and earth sprang. The named is but the mother that rears the 10,000 creatures, each after its own kind. When I read that, my first reaction was, what the hell is this guy talking about? So I asked my venerated teacher one day, I said to him, Boogaloo, how do you get in touch with this Tao thing? And what he said to me was, you can't really understand the Tao or the infinite self intellectually. It's beyond the mind. It's like a riddle, really. The only way to comprehend it is through heightened awareness and feeling. He said, try this discipline. He suggested that I rise at 4 a.m. in the morning and walk in silence for an hour in the forest. So I began the discipline, rising daily, walking in all weathers. In England, if you know England, well, there's plenty of weather here. And I would walk silently through the forest in the dark, not really having a bloody clue what I was doing. But the funny thing is that having done that discipline daily for three years, I eventually got what the Tao was all about. The first line of the Tao says that you cannot put a name to it. And that's a fact. It's a truth. The Tao is the essence of all things that sustain the 10,000 creatures. It is the underlying beauty that comes from the grace of the God force flowing through all things. That grace, that life force, some people call it the etheric, you can actually see it. Get yourself in a relaxed state and stare at the top of a tree, preferably at sunset. After a minute or so, move your gaze to the area of sky to the right of the tree. Stare approximately where one o'clock would be on the face of a watch. Now, without moving your eyes from the point in the sky yeah, that, that you're staring happen. at, move your attention back to the top of the tree. Remember, don't move your eyes, just adjust your attention. Doing this, you engage your peripheral vision. You'll see the enormous flame-like spirals of energy firing out from the tree in all directions. If you can't do it first time, leave it and try again later. A good time would be after one of the fasts that I mentioned in one of the later sessions. 
Once you see the energy. Okay, we're going to do a little pause here because I'm going to take a break and come back. I just was, I was consuming it. I was listening to it and um, I don't want to talk over him too much. It's like a respect thing. I was listening to it and I was like, oh, I'll just do this now. But I was going to do a live like, I don't know, in like an hour or something. Um, let's see. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to have a little conversation because of some of the comments. Breast in power, Keith. Breast in power, Keith. Breast in power, Keith. You are so loved. I love um everything Sloan and everything she's made. That was such a fucked up thing. Um, besides just sending love and respect to both of them. I don't want to talk about it too much. Keithy. I'll tell you about this box of lemon joints. And we can who wants to bet if the spoon is still in here? The big hefty metal spoon you would expect to be in a $35 sharp stone grinder. Um, anyway, this pack of joints. So circles. Okay, so it came with seven. There's three in here, which means I smoked four. I just really impressed myself with that math. <laughs> but this is because I think each one of them has been traumatizing for me. I don't like wasting weed. I'm very serious about this. And each one of these is like a lemon joint. Like I can't stand when like a joint will like light halfway. You know what I mean? I always remember this guy I dated in high school and he would like, he would roll blunts and he would like lick his, like if it was burning a little bit higher one way, he would like lick his thumb and his finger and like put it on the thing. I've tried that before. It doesn't work for me. <laughs> so I end up just like trying to like put some of it in the bowl so I'm not wasting it. And then like, anyway, so we're going to get, we're going to give this one a shot. I don't know. I mean, I feel like I've gotten these joints before and they've been fine. Um, but I'm going to get my bowl because I have a, okay. I'm not going to say I have a feeling I'm going to have to put it in the bowl, but just in case. And honestly, honestly, if this one doesn't work, we're getting credit back. Um, <laughs> wait, which invention? Are you going to get copyright or flagged for playing that? I, I would love for them to have credit or copyright. I don't think so because I, uh, unfortunately, uh, I mean, I'm, YouTube doesn't pay me, so. I don't know. They've been they've been borrowing two hundred dollars for a while now. I don't even know how to like. I gotta figure out interest on this. Um, but I'm not playing it for. I mean, I get copyright stuff, which I don't think is like good for my channel. It just got monetized. I'm not paying that much attention to it, especially since they don't pay me. <laughs> but um, uh, if it got copywritten, I wouldn't care. Um, but I don't think it will. Like none of my Osho videos get copywritten. It's like hilarious. Think about the irony of that actually. Things like music, like, like I don't know, WAP by Cardi B or something, like that would get copywritten. But like this magical gold, like Stort Wild, Osho wouldn't, you know? Um, but I don't care either way. I mean, the video, I mean, it doesn't get taken down. But I suggest everyone, I'm so funny. There's a laptop here and a laptop here. And I'm like, how could I copy paste this link? No, I can't do that. <laughs> but I like keeping myself that arm's length from technology and shit. I don't want to know. Um, there probably is a weird way to do it, but I don't even want to do it. <laughs> but it's infinite self. Um, it's a book. Uh, I highly recommend getting the book anywhere from Amazon, anywhere but Amazon. 33 Steps to Reclaiming Your Inner Power by Stuart Wilde. Every book that Stuart Wilde has written, I have found to be extremely powerful and helpful. And I wish I still had all of them. I did at one point. Let's see. Uh, 
Um, <laughs> wait, what's your name? One up, S S Scott. You're so funny. You always remind me to spark the joint. I had it in my hair. I don't know why I ever do that. Well, I have to go get the bowl. Remember? We're going to get you in the Swisher gang. Actually, what's the Swisher gang? Oh, Swisher Sweets. My dad's third wife smoked them, but not with weed. Like she smoked them as, those are like little cigars, right? He made us climb a 40 foot tree. Okay. So when Mickey's writing, he fucking took a retreat with Stuart Wilde, like in real life. Um, and it's Stuart Wilde's retreats were very intense. And I think, uh, Correct me if I'm wrong. You said he trained us like Genghis Khan, like we were, he was Genghis Khan and we were his army. So the experiences that would happen were all designed to break down the ego. Um, if you guys are just getting here, there were snakes, apparently two or a few, I don't know if you said two or a few opera people, opera like actors were there and then they ran out after the snakes. Um, Scott. You're not my daddy. Relax. Um, he made you climb a 40-foot tree wall with gear on and jump like we were flying. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Because I have a feeling that there are people that have the ability to fly. They just don't consciously know it. Um, so wait, as a gal at the bottom... Okay, so you're a, a man, right? Mickey is my feeling. So you jumped, but like there was a person that was making sure you weren't going to fall on your face. Did you try to fly? Did he tell you to try to fly? Only tapes you have left are on Camelot. I don't know what Camelot is. Is that a? I feel like I know every book of his. Did he write a book called Camelot? I loved the mist of the mists of Avalon. I loved, like, um, what was it? You know, uh, Sir Lancelot, Arthur, and the Round Table. So, yeah, is that like the same thing as a cone, Jared? Because I'm good with cones when you just chop the weed in. <laughs> Rolling joints, not so much. Eh? You because you're tell you're telling me like spark it up. Like you're I'm like, you're not the boss of me. You're not my daddy. Don't tell me what to do. <laughs> I'm just being funny. Um to myself. The sweet the sweat lodge was really hard. Wait, hold on. Okay, you're a female. Yes, it was. The face, the fear of heights. Um, wait, so the person that was on the bottom was making, like, it was that kind of situation, right? I've never done it, but, like, you're falling, but at the very end, oh, is it like a bungee jump? Sorry. <laughs> I get excited. Oh, my gosh. I do what I want. What's your name, c 23 ck Two, three. What does that stand for? I have to go get a lighter. <laughs> now I have a lighter. I have to get the bowl. I mean, uh, that was a lecture on tapes by Stuart Wilde. It was called Camelot. Was it about money? He did a lot of stuff about money. I feel like, I don't know. I, I don't know if he became more heartful. Did you say no when you said you you hadn't heard of his experiences, like what he was talking about towards the end of his life? And like, I don't remember verbatim, but maybe I'll try to find it for us. But he was saying that like dark entities were there, but you just have to not like it was like deep stuff. It was like you just navigate it. It was just more it was he got so heart centered. He was like a you know, uh, uh, what do you call it? Like, um, he cussed like a sailor, but he was like a fucking angel. You know what I mean? And he got to like such a intense place. Chris, 
and your favorite number is 23. Chris, how old are you? 23. And your last name starts with a K. You love 23. You don't. <laughs> and okay, don't spark it. Just keep fucking. Oh, shut up. You guys are so bossy. Did you ever consider that? Ow. Whoever said I want to grow up and become bossy? Chris, Scott, who else told me to spark it? Wait, Jared, do I look a little crazy? I am. I'm a fucking crazy drug addict. Haven't you listened to my sister? <sighs> yes, but we had climbing gear. So it's sort of like a controlled fall. That's cool. Like, I, it's like I only really imagined him with men. That's cool that he let women study. And I've never heard an iota of anything about him being weird. Like, usually guys, like spiritual teachers, will end up, um, you know, human stuff comes out. And I'm not, I'm not judging. I'm just saying it's very rare when it doesn't. And it's cool. Your sister's... I don't... Don't talk about... Sloan is my real sister. I said, did you hear what Whitney Cummings says about me? <laughs> She's not my sister. Um, um, what was I going to say? First of all, climbing a tree, did you use like, uh, like I'm thinking of rugby shoes. I can't, whatever. I'm not going to say I can't. I had a lot of trouble climbing rope like in PE and stuff. I mean, women are just naturally like not as strong upper body and it's a lot of upper body. Okay, so this is the, what did we say? The fourth out of seven joints that I've smoked out of this circles. What are we working with? Melanade. Um, and the other ones have been weird. And now you're all going to witness, am I doing something weird? I'm going to light it normal. And the joint should smoke like a joint. Oh, quickly, because there are a couple pot smokers in here. Is there ever a thing that like you go like, I was thinking like, do I like need to go like this with the filter? And I did that. Like, is there a thing that I don't know about? Like sometimes you have to like go like that. Yeah, okay. I'm I'm sure that was still so intense. Uh and 105 of you did it, or 105 minus the opera people. Not opera. I keep did I say that before? Soap opera. Wait, what, Chris? Chris. I thought we had something. <laughs> Lucas? Okay. Bubusk. Why are you going to blow up the spot? Good for you. Yeah, I mean, everybody has like a different thing with weed. I don't think weed is for everyone. Oh my God. But um, it's definitely for me. <laughs> Hold on. Come on, baby. See? Huh. 
Isn't this the cutest thing? It got it has like a hole in it, but I got a cup of my dad and me, a coffee cup. Okay, this is a conspiracy. This is fully lit. I'm sucking. Okay, that works. <laughs> It is, I mean, ish, but I was wondering if it was like a filter thing. I think I also, because it has like a recessed, stupid ass, not recessed filter. I don't even know what the other side is called. I don't know why they would have that recessed, but it makes it harder to lay. Okay, this time. <laughs> Everyone has their different path with stuff. I um, I support sobriety. I support what everybody and anybody wants to do. I um, I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't. Uh, yeah, I guess I was gonna like validate myself or whatever. Everybody has their own thing. I think everyone's. I know everyone's brains are different. Everyone's experiences are different. I'm sure at some point I will stop smoking pot or not smoke as much, but for now, that's not part of the plan. So, and um, also I don't really get very high very often. Um, a lot of it is like, helps my heart. And um, I used to say even like, I was in AA for a year and a half, like 10 years ago, and went through the steps, took people through the steps when I would like get up on the podium and speak. So many times I said, um, I'm not telling people to go smoke pot, but for me, pot was like a cigarette with like a kick. It was never really, you know, but it I've seen it affects people like way different. Um, just be loving with yourself, Mickey. I can tell that you feel like that, that's in alignment with, let's see, the vape, the, oh, like the pot pen and it hurt your lungs. I mean, I had a friend that was like, actually, I don't even know. I can't imagine bringing anything into my lungs besides air. I was like, I get it. <laughs> Calm down. I'm not forcing a joint down your mouth. <laughs> but um, yeah, Sloan has been sober, I think for like 30 years. I mean, I don't know. I don't, I won't, I know I'll never speak for her. I don't think, she, I know, I'm pretty sure she doesn't do like AA or anything. She just doesn't take stuff into her body like that. And I think that's fucking awesome. Um, once in a while, I think like, um, like, like when she's talking about stuff like that, like I'll feel like I'm not stupid or like I'm making excuses for myself. But it'll just, it'll be like another seed planted maybe. But um, yeah, I'm thoroughly good with myself. And there's been nothing else in my whole life or since I, I would, I would argue my eating disorder, like anorexia started probably around when I started dancing professionally at 11. There's been nothing that has successfully kept me from uh, putting my fingers down my throat after I eat or um not abstaining for food from food besides weed. So it's kind of my like eating disorder medicine. I talked to my therapist about it for a while. He's like, are you sure? Da, 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 da. We went through this whole thing like last year and um, eating, like um, get letting my, getting hungry, making food, stuff like that is not easy without it. I tried doing the CBD thing, but I also was kind of doing it for him. I was like, I don't want to do this, but if you really want me to, I will. Um, and I was like, I also won't lie to you, you know? And then after I eat, when like I'm digesting, it's super important. It's like, um, I mean, I haven't thrown up in 10 years, but it's that like uncomfortable feeling of like, not being full, but like not being empty, you know, and weed just takes away 
anxiety. I made a video a long time ago called The Green Martians about basically like after I eat, and it was an eating disorder meeting, uh, meeting. It was an eating disorder video. After I eat and I'm like digesting, I'll like take some hits of weed. And I just feel like these little like helpful green Martians go in there and sort of like facilitate digestion, <laughs> get everything ready for elimination. That's so cool that you're connected to Sloan. I've known Sloan since 2011. I think it was 2011, the first time we met. Um, she's absolutely one of the most, my favorite humans and one of the most important people on this planet. <coughs> I definitely recognize it as like, like when I walk my dogs and stuff, like I'll be annoyed if I forget my pot pen. I'm like, Ashley. <laughs> so like, but you know what that is, Mickey, you know, I know that I can tell you this straight up without even having to explain it. That's just habit. Anything. If I put a spoon on my head every day for 28 days, I would just keep doing it. I mean, you see people like with masks in their car, they're just like in habit. You know what I mean? Anything you do for 28 days, good or bad, you're not going to think about the fact that you still do it, you know? Um, so I know a lot of it is that. But it's also, I guess, like my Linus blanket too, in a way. And um, absolutely my like security or insurance for making sure that I eat food and keep it down. I mean, like, I know realistically I'm never going to throw up again, like the way that I did 10 years ago, like put my fingers down my throat. But um, I get like when change or sh stuff happens in my life, I tend to eat less. And I know, I mean, I've talked to a therapist about this. It's a very common thing. Like you'll revert back to that. So I don't know. This is like my stable medicine. No, I was way early, Wolfie. Yay. Maybe this is just going to blend into, we listened to Stuart Wild. Because I was listening to him and I was like, oh, I might as well. And then I was going to come back. But you know how it goes. <laughs> We've been talking. Um, who was he barking at? He, Hondo, likes to bark at our neighbor that lives across the way. Because he likes to let her know that, she's, that he's here and stuff. He likes to bark at people outside. He likes to bark at other dogs. Ozzy likes to snore. He's such a good snorer, right? Oy. Manzanitas! Do you think I rolled this myself? I can't believe it actually works. I'm so happy. Um... Stuart was an alcoholic. So was uh, Alan Watts. Did he drink like while he was on the retreat with you guys? That's kind of like that's kind of interesting because when I when like the when I learned about Alan Watts and stuff, and the amount of people that tell me he was an alcoholic, like when you hear that man speak. I don't know how he was in his personal life. Usually alcoholics are kind of sloppy. Um, you were in treatment 10 times. Oh, like rehab treatment? But going into Native American rehab and doing sweat lodge was what helped me. There's no bullshit there, right? <laughs> it's like you and you. That's what I'm, that's like, I guess, what's so important. We're all looking for, I'll speak for myself, or I'll speak for what I think. I think a lot of us, and a few people, this is like a kind of a menage a trois, a few comments people have left and emails people have sent me. But um, like people are looking for things now, or you know what I mean? Like uh, tools things that they're in alignment with, um, it's, you know, 
it's really interesting. This whole, I never would have imagined, and I'm sure Sloan would agree with me that we would be doing these lives on YouTube, like even like five years ago and like look forward to them and feel that they were fun. And like, there's this like sense of like community and real people. I remember a woman saying to me like, uh, maybe 10 years ago or so, I, I never did like chat rooms and stuff like that. Oh, she was talking to me about getting like an astrology reading online or something. I was like, yeah, but how can you like, how can that be that helpful? Like you're not in person. And she was like, Ashley, the people that are here right now in this time are designed for this time. Like you can pe feel people's energy. Like most of the time in the chat, like I'm getting, the more I'm comfortable doing lives with chats, like I can feel people's energy. Really, Mickey, the only reason I thought you were a dude was because I didn't think Stuart Wilde took, uh, I didn't really think about it. <laughs> I also didn't think he took women on retreats. The fourth night he flipped his car. Isn't that way how he passed? Hold on, let me go up. He's so funny, Store Wild. Oh my gosh. Okay. Um, Ashley, no Zach sales, please. I'll do a better one. Hold on, Manzanitas. You better, you know, I'll talk to you about that later. Stuart was an alcoholic. Gotta go. Bye, Chris. You know, my mom taught me how to do that, by the way. She called it French exhaling. Like when I was, uh, I don't know, in college, or high school or college. Like I smoked cigarettes for a while. And when she would drink wine or we would drink together, she would want a cigarette. And I remember, I'll never forget. She's like, do you know how to French exhale? And I was like, so surprised she spoke a cigarette with me anyway. And um, I was like, no, what's that? And she's like, <laughs> and she like coughed. I was like, not the end part though, right? <laughs> um, you didn't drink until the last night. So he stayed sober throughout it. Yeah, that'd be kind of weird. Some guy like teaching you about the, all this stuff and like, you know what I mean? Um, and then you, what, you had like a party on the last night? Did he get wasted? Did, did he turn into a different person? What about that Bob Saget line in, um, what's the movie? Dave Chappelle, Half-Baked at the AA meeting when Bob Saget has that line. He was like, you're here for weed? I used to suck dick for Coke, which we all know now is a true story. Stuart had his demons. I think maybe that's what he was talking about at the end. Um, maybe it wasn't demons that happen when you get to like a certain place. Maybe it was his demons. Wait, who is, is he married? His energy is so sexy. Sorry. Um, oh, that's cool. You're an astrologer. Jared, you do have beautiful words and vibrations always. The stuff were men. Oh, the staff were men. Oh, thank you. I love you, Gail. Sorry I missed your last lives. I'm happy you're here. Sorry, silly. We're talking about Stuart Wilde. Mickey went on his retreat. Hold on. And the last night they got drunk. Stuart was an alcoholic like Alan Watts. Oh, you've been here, Gail. You've seen some of it. Um, um, I can never smoke cigarettes or drink. I was able to do both of those things. <laughs> um. Mickey, can I ask you? Oh, so sweat lodge, did he answer? 
So listen, Wolfie, a sweat lodge is a very cold structure. And the whole idea is to keep it freezing cold. It's like an ice box. <laughs> Sorry. I'm being a smart ass. It's like a sauna. Yeah, I don't know if he answered. Did he answer? You have a picture drinking a glass with him. I thought you said you could never drink alcohol. I guess you made that exception. I bet. I bet he just, I was like thinking that. I bet he just had beautiful women, like, and probably didn't get married because, I don't know. I mean, no shade on anyone who's married. I just don't think the government should be involved in our relationships on such a level. But. I guess there's tax breaks, but he didn't pay taxes. Evolu so what's an evolutionary astrologer? If you want to put your information or anything, or I don't know if you're looking for clients or there's 13 people in here. <laughs> I love Alan Watts. I love you, Gail. <laughs> what are you laughing at, cheeky monkey? It's not funny. Take it serious. But I want to talk about that. I didn't know Stuart Wilde was an alcoholic until right now. Um, I don't love him any less. Um, I feel like, and I was listening to a Paul Romano video today, and he did one on Kanye West that's kind of interesting. Kanye West, oh, I put it on my Patreon. Kanye, it was like talking about programming. It was like, it was so funny. It was like perfect from Sloan's Live yesterday. But, um, Oh, yeah. As much as you want to talk about being an evolutionary astrologer, please do. Um, oh, yeah. Alan Watts and I guess Stuart Wilde being alcoholics. And Paul was saying most geniuses are really brilliant people will have some kind of thing. I'm really like the more I'm thinking how recent so much of like mental illness and like the last DSM-5 is. It's like 40 years or so. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I really want to stay away from all those labels like that. Oh, he's bipolar or bipolar and that's why he's genius or whatever. Um, but it's so interesting because how do we know there were alcoholics? I don't know. I have a few different stems of like conversation in my mind. I've had spiritual experiences being completely sober, being on um, weed, whatever. Um, I want to say the ones like, I don't know. It's hard to say, but um, like, like, did it affect his work, their work? Like, I wonder this kind of stuff. Like, on the retreat, Mickey, did you feel like, okay, because he talks a lot about that. Like, Stuart Wilde says, don't drink too much alcohol. Don't do too many drugs. It fucks with your aura. And I'm not saying, like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not saying, like, he's a hypocrite. But, like, how did he reconcile that? I don't know. I'm thinking out loud. Does that, does that make sense what I'm saying? And then Alan Watts, too. I never heard Alan Watts say anything specifically about alcohol or drugs, but Stuart definitely did. And then um, it just makes my heart, like, have empathy for them more than anything. But everything I've listened to, everything I've listened to from Alan Watts has been so fucking powerful. So it makes me wonder, not it makes me wonder, like, would he be more powerful without it? Or like, did he need that if, to like do his work here sometimes? I remember watching a documentary about 